Good morning to today's Sabbath service, and I'm really excited uh, to be here with all of you, and thank you guys for being here today, and my family being here, and um, and all of you online and that are watching this message. I'm excited for us, because I believe that today is going to be an exciting message. Um, I woke up today not knowing exactly what to talk about again, and God woke me out of bed and said, this is what we're talking about, and I said, okay, well, that's what we're doing. And it's really encouraging, because sometimes throughout my week, I get, you know, sometimes a little discouraged, thinking... God, where you at? I haven't heard you give me any messages, any signs, or nothing. And and he was like, well, my feast days are over. <laughs> he just kind of said, my feast days are over. Get back to work. <laughs> it was just kind of like that attitude, you know, towards everything. And so I just, you know, shared, uh, you know, just started praying to God and said, God, you know, hey man, you got other stuff to do than just talk to me all the time and, and talk to talk to our ministry all the time. And you got other stuff to do in this world to, to pull off what you're going to be pulling off here shortly. So I said, amen. Now I'm just going to go ahead and, and just, uh, you know, just keep, keep trucking on. But it's, it's been a little challenging week, a couple weeks for me, and for several reasons. One is in business, you know, our business is doing well, and it's doing fine, it's, you know, getting back up to speed. But um, I was just like, God, you know, what's the next step? Where do we go next? What's the next direction? What, what do you want me to do? And he said, just be patient. So... This message is empowering for me, and I think it'll be empowering for all of you as, as well, and inspiring, because you're going to see today the Lord's um, plan for our lives. So let's go through it. Let's go ahead and jump right into some scripture. Um, first, let's go to Ecclesiastes. Do you have papers you want to read out somewhere? Yeah. Two after. Three. Ecclesiastes 3, starting in verse 1. Ecclesiastes 3, starting in verse 1. The title of this message is A Season for Everything. It says, there is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under the heavens. Time to be born. Time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stone and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. And a time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet, no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. And I know there is nothing better for people to be happy than to be happy and to do good while they live. That each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in the toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it, and nothing can be taken away. God does it so that people will fear Him. Amen. Amen. And, you know, that's what we've been preaching for you guys for a long time. We've been sharing this message that, you know, God has been doing different things at different times. And, and we feel this, we've lived this, this, um, this life that there's been a time for different things. There's been a different season. And God's going to show us the season that we've been in as a family, as a ministry. Uh, you know, we've been doing this for eight years. And, and God's done different things in our lives that we've revealed and we've seen. But I don't know if you've actually seen it as clear as today that God's going to reveal it to you. Because God's done an amazing work in your life. For you to be not only encouraged, but inspired and be uplifted by what the Lord has done for you and through you. 
See, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, years ago, God did a lot of things through his Israelites. First of all, he did it through Noah. You know, he was in the line of Seth, and he did some amazing things of, of Noah, with Noah. And then, uh, you know, his, his child, child came, and, and, and all the children, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And he actually did some things through them. And, and then, of course, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And the 12th tribe of Israel came, and he did some amazing things and raised up Moses, one man. He raised up one man to lead his Israelites to, to learn a few things. They had to learn God's covenant. They had to learn the Ten Commandments. He gave them the, the decrees and laws that they had to live by at that time. He also gave them his holy days, his appointed feast days. The appointed feast days of the Lord so that they can honor him every year. He gave them, you know, different days that they needed to worship and how to do it. He taught them everything. He gave them manna so they can live, know that they can live off the, the, you know, manna instead of just off all this choice food. He, he just taught them how to live. And it was just amazing. That was a time that God did for the, for the people. But something happened. You know what happened? The, the brothers and Israelites, they disobeyed God. They disobeyed the Lord. They stopped obeying him and stopped following him and stopped following his ways. And I just want to show you real quick, just briefly, um, that what he did to them, and then you'll be encouraged on what he's done through you. So just really quick, Jeremiah 3, Jeremiah 3, starting verse 6. Title there is Unfaithful Israel. Now, of course, Israel are the Israelites. It says, During the reign of King Josiah, Josiah, the Lord said to me, Have you seen what faithful, faithless Israel has done? She, of course, at that time, she was the bride because of, of Christ at that time, because that's why it's called a she, because at the time the Israelites were the Lord's bride. He had married them at, when he gave the Ten Commandments. That was a covenant between him and the Lord. Him and his people. So that's why it says she, just in case you didn't understand that. It says she has gone up on every high hill and have, under every spreading tree and has committed adultery there. This is very important to understand about adultery back in those days. Adultery wasn't just physical adultery between man and woman. It was actually spiritual adultery between the Israelites and other false gods and other false religions and things that were going on at that time. They were committing adultery. They were marrying out of their group. They were doing all types of false things that God told them not to do. And that was the adultery of that time. So they had committed adultery. Look what it says. I thought that after she had done all this, she would return to me. But she did not. And her uns a faithful sister Judah saw it. I gave faithless Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away because of all her adulteries. So at that time, they had the ten tribe, and then they had the two tribe, which was Judah and Israel, and they were separated at some time. They was we called Judah and Israel, but both of them committed adultery towards the Lord. Look what it says. Verse 9. Because Israel's immorality mattered so little to her, she defiled the land and committed adultery with stone and wood. In other words, they were worshiping false gods with stone and wood. That's what was happening. In spite of all her unfaithful her unfaithful sister, Judah, did not return to me with all her heart, but only in pretense, declares the Lord. What that means is, in pretense, meaning she may have come and may have been honoring the Lord, but didn't really want to be there. Mm. It's not like some people go to church on Sunday, but don't really want to be at church on Sunday. They're going because they have to be. Maybe their parents told them to be. Or maybe they go because their spouse is forcing them to go. Or you know what I'm saying? There's reason why people honor different days and go to these holidays and holy days and stuff like that. I don't want to go. They're grudgingly going, but they're there. And that's what it means that they were there in pretense. And so, you know, that's very important for us to understand that God hates that. When we do something that we know we should be doing, but really don't want to do it. Especially when it comes to God's holy days and the Sabbath days. But let's keep reading. Verse 11. The Lord said to me, faithless Israel is more righteous than unfaithful Judah. Go proclaim this message toward the north. Return faithless Israel, declares the Lord, and I will frown you no longer. For I am faithful, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever, only acknowledge your guilt. You have rebelled against the Lord your God. 
You have scattered your favor to foreign gods under every spreading tree and have not obeyed me, declares the Lord. See, that's what they did. They basically went and um, started having uh, uh, worship to Moloch and all kinds of false deities and all kinds of stuff. It was crazy back then. But I mean, think about it now. Does that same type of thing happen today? Yeah. Oh, at a, at a much higher rate. I mean, there's 42,000 or something like that, 47,000 different denominations of Christianity. <laughs> there wasn't 42,000 denominations of Buddha or, or any other false god. But of the, of the word Christianity, there's 42,000 different denominations, different ways to do it. Unbelievable. So today that same thing is happening. People are worshiping other gods in the same way. But look what it says. So, so he had given them a certificate of divorce. In other words, he divorced his people and let them go do their thing. Let them go do their own way. And that's what's happening around right the world right now. That's what's going on. That's what we're seeing. Now look at another thing the Lord did. Is he took away his holy feast days. Because God had appointed times. And he took them away from his people. Let's, let's read about that. Let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah 1. Because a lot of people don't even know, where did all these pagan holidays come from? Christmas and Easter and all that stuff. Well, if you do your research, a lot of that's been created by the Vatican and the Romans um, back in the day, and they invented these fake holidays. But God allowed it to happen, and here's why he allowed it to happen. Let's read. Isaiah 1, verse 13. It says, you can read before, but we're just going to start here. It says, stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense are detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I can't bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festival, I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my face from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. See, the Lord hates those fake prayers. He hates those. Um, he hates people going to him with the wrong heart. He hates it. And so what did he do? He despised it. He, he, uh, imagine right now you're here at the Sabbath day, but your heart's thinking of being somewhere else. Imagine that. Imagine you being here and saying, man, i got to go to that Sabbath. i got to go to Sabbath. No, you don't have to go to Sabbath. God doesn't want you to have to go to Sabbath service. He doesn't want you to have to take a day of rest. He wants you to want to take a day of rest. He wants you to enjoy taking a day of rest. Because this is the day he's communing with us. The Lord's talking to you through me and through the scriptures right now, telling you what he wants. He's telling you that he wants you to be here. You don't have to be here. He wants you to want to. And that's the heart of God. You know, we get to honor the Sabbath day. I was talking to a friend of mine named K. Ross, which I mentioned a little bit, but we were talking, and uh, we were talking yesterday, and we've been talking about the Lord a lot lately. And one of the things we were talking about is honoring the Sabbath day, and I said, you know, imagine your job, your boss told you, you got to take a day off. On, on Wednesday this month, you got to take a day off. And every Wednesday for four weeks, you got to take that day off. What are you going to say? Oh, no, that's a burden. Oh, I can't take a day off. What are you doing? That's legalistic. Come on, boss. I, I need to work. I want to work seven days. You wouldn't do that. You'd say, wow, thank you so much, boss. For giving me that day off. Thank you so much. In the middle of the week, too? That's amazing. Thank you. But the Lord gives it to you based on his calendar. And we say it's a burden. It's difficult because we got to go back to work. Wow. The next month he comes back and says, okay, next month's not going to be on Wednesday, it's going to be on Friday. Now you take Friday off and, oh man, no way, it's a burden. <laughs> you see how silly that is if you really think about it? But isn't that what the world does right now when we show them the calendar, God's calendar, the new moon and all that? They say it's a burden. No, it's not a burden. What's a burden is working every single day of the week. That's a burden. So it's, it, it, this is what was happening back then. They were, God just said, you know what? I hate your festivals. I hate when you celebrate the new moon. I hate when you celebrate the feast days. I hate when you celebrate my Sabbath days. Because the hearts weren't really there to, be, to want to do it. And I think that same attitude happens today. 
Not with the Sabbath day, but when they go to church on Sundays. Right? Sometimes Sunday could be the most unspiritual day of the week. <laughs> because of all the people there with the wrong heart. From God's perspective. So let's look at what actually happened from that point. So, you know, God hated his feast days, but what did he do about it? Let's read. Let's see Hosea. Intro. Hosea 2. Look what it says, Hosea 2, starting at verse 8. She has not acknowledged that I was the one who gave her the grain, the new wine and the oil, who lavished her with silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Well, God gave them gold and silver and all this stuff, and they used to make a fake God, Baal, God of Baal. Unbelievable. You know, that's like God giving us money, and then we go buy a Buddha and sit in our living room. You know what I mean? God buys, gives us our, our you know, business, it lets it thrive, and then we go put idols all around our house. That's what that would be equivalent to right now. I can't even fathom doing something like that. But that's what they did. Let's keep reading. Verse 9. Therefore, I will take away my grain when it ripens, my new wine when it is ready. I will take back my wool and my linen. If you understand the bride, it's always in linen. He said he's going to take back the linen from his people. It says, intended to cover their naked body. So now I will expose her lewdness before the eyes of her lovers. In other words, from the eyes of the world. No one will take her out of my hands. I will stop all her celebrations, her yearly festivals, her new moons, her Sabbath days, all her appointed feasts. So you see, the reason why there's so many deceptive teachings and so many different holidays and Christmas and Easter and all these fake holidays and Halloween that's coming right now, the reason why everybody celebrates all these things instead of God's holy days that are in the Bible is because God took them away from his people. So if his people don't know them, what's the probabilities of the rest of the world knowing them? That's why there's so much deception out there. And so you're watching this video right now, you got to understand that these feast days were the Lord's feast days. If you read Leviticus 23, they were the Lord's appointed feast. And he gave them to his people to honor him. But they chose not to. They chose to disobey. They chose to worship them in vain. And so God took them away. He said, I'm done. Go do what you want. Go follow the rules of Baal. You can read Jeremiah 10. It talks about do not cut down a tree and fasten it with gold and silver and adorn it and, and put it on, on wood so it will not totter. In other words, don't build a Christmas tree. It says don't do that. But, you know, the world does that. So guess what? The disciples and Christians did the same thing. You see, this is what we've been teaching for the last eight years. Of, of We've been talking about these types of things. And God's been revealing these things to us. And it's been so encouraging because, see, God took these things away. But he also says that in the last days, he's going to bring his people back under covenant. That's what he said he's going to do. He says he's going to bring his holy feast days back. He says that he's going to bring his people back in the covenant. Now, this is very important to understand. Because you got to understand that of who you are in Christ. Why do, why do you think God wants you to know who you are in Christ? What do you think that is? Uh, for one, so that you can have confidence in him and carry out what he's asking you to do. Yeah, so you can have confidence. He doesn't want you to be a wimp and be insecure and be doubting who you are in Christ. He wants you to know exactly who you are in Christ. Exactly who you are. So you can have confidence. So you can have power. When you go speak and open your mouth, you have power. Just like the disciples back then that walked with Jesus. You think the disciples, the twelve that walked around with Jesus, you think they had more confidence than the people that just were in the crowd. What do you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. Peter had so much confidence, he tried to get out the boat and walk on water. And he walked on water till he lost his faith. And then he began to sink. That's what it says in Matthew. Yeah. You see, they had boldness. Peter preached a bold message. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sin. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Right? He pre preached that because he was bold. The disciples got the Holy Spirit. They watched Jesus ascend to heaven. They watched that happen. They were bold. They weren't... Oh, these little timid guys? No. That's why they were willing to die for their faith because they saw what the Lord did. They walked with him. But you know what? Was Moses bold? 
I mean, Moses is a very pretty bald dude to walk up to the Pharaoh, who he just used to be a family with, who thought it was family, and walk up and say, let these two million people go to go worship the God. Just because God told him to do it, all he had was a stick. He didn't have a gun, he didn't have a sword, he had nothing. He had a stick in his hand, and his brother. But he boldly went up to the Pharaoh, who knew he, who could have killed him instantly. But out of, by faith, he went up there. And what did God do? God did some miracles to Moses. Right? That was bold. That wasn't no little timid guy. I'm sure Noah was a pretty bold dude to build an ark in the middle of the desert. You know, I'm sure he was bold. I mean, telling the entire world, repent, and nobody would listen. And you know, he said, even though no one was listening, I'm still going to build this ark. He did it with power. He did it with boy. You know why? Because he knew the Lord spoke to him. There was no doubt in his mind that the Lord spoke to him. I'm sure some days he may have had doubt. But that doubt subsided, and he kept building the ark. <laughs> right? I'm sure Moses, at some point, matter of fact, is in the scriptures. Moses doubted, why are you giving all this burden to me? Take this away from me. And then God helped him and spread it out to all the disciples. And then they all participated. Moses had doubts sometimes, but you know what? He still persevered and walked to the promised land. Right? Yeah. He was bold and courageous. And I think that's what God wants from us. Because he wants us to know who we are in Christ. We, when I say we, I'm talking about the Israelites. The disciples that eight years ago, the Lord started showing him who he is. Because he started showing us some things in the scriptures. We're going to look at a scripture on that. Let's look at Jeremiah 3. Jeremiah. Three. Jeremiah 3, starting in verse 14. Okay. Look what it says. Jeremiah 3, verse 14. This is right after they didn't obey him. You can read a little bit before they disobeyed the Lord. But look what it says in verse 14. Return faith to this people, declared the Lord, for I am your husband. Meaning the Israelites are his bride. For I choose, will choose you. I will choose you. So this is something in the past that's going to happen in the future. This is something he was talking about, something that's going to happen in the future, because he had already chose them when he came out of Egypt. So now he's talking about something that's going to happen later. He's telling the people to repent. He says, I will choose you from one town and two from one clan, from a clan, and bring me to Zion. Then I will give you a shepherd after my own heart. In other words, they're going to give you one man. And usually it's a man that's the shepherds in the scriptures. He's going to give you one shepherd. He's going to give you a shepherd who's going to do something. Who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. So what he said is in the last days, he's going to raise up someone to lead you with knowledge and understanding. Look what it says. In those days, your number will increase greatly in the land. So in other words, the number of people will increase in the land, declares the Lord. People will no longer say, the ark of the coming of the Lord. In other words, no one will be talking about the Lord's coming. They won't be talking about what happened in Noah's day. They're not going to be talking about that in this time. And if you look at the world today, how many people talk about the ark of the covenant? Almost none. Very few. You see, almost nobody talks about the Ten Commandments and the Ark of the Covenant and what happened back then. Just like it says in Scripture. Look what it says. It will never enter their minds or be remembered. It will not be missed, nor will another one be made. Wow. Mm -hmm. You see, that's talking about today. That's last day's time, what he's talking about. At that time... They will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. Isn't that what they do today? They think Jerusalem, the land over there that's called Jerusalem, the throne of the Lord. That's why the United States built their whole embassy over there in Jerusalem. Thinking that's the throne of the Lord. Now where is the throne of the Lord today? In the kingdom of heaven. We know that. Where is the temple of the Lord? We are the temple of the Lord. We just went through that last week. See, because of that we are the temple and the Lord's Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, are the people that's going to be in the kingdom of God, 
This is not talking about that. This is talking about the Jerusalem over there, the land. People in the world are going to say that's the throne of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And all nations will gather in Jerusalem to honor the name of the Lord. So at some point, all nations have gathered there. Matter of fact, um, the Pope did a, a thing years ago. All the nation's leaders gathered in Jerusalem to honor, quote unquote, the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. But look what it says. No, no longer will they follow stubbornness in their evil hearts. In those days, listen to this, the people of Judah will join the people of Israel and together they will come from the northern land to the land I gave their ancestors as an inheritance. So at some point, the land of Ju the people of Judah, which I believe the people of Judah were brought on slave ships over here to, to Egypt, spiritual Egypt, which is the U.S. And we are the people of Judah. We'll meet the people of Israel. And I believe the people of Israel are the people over there in India. And maybe in Africa and those areas over there. Happened this year where they all came together, just like the Bible says. And uh, we'll, we'll start to focus on the inheritance. What was the inheritance that the Lord talked about to their people back then? It was going to have the kingdom of God. And I believe that's going to happen real soon. And God has shown us that. He, he got us focused on that this year. So it's amazing to understand that God is doing exactly what the Bible says right here. He's bringing his people back. And he wants you to know who you are and how special you are to him. This is the message God gave me this morning, which I desperately needed. I need it. I need it for several reasons. But I want to share with you some of the things that he shared. Because in the last eight years, in all of our lives, this is what happened. The Lord chose us to learn and keep his commandments and to fulfill his promises through us. I couldn't, we could not find a single person in the world honoring the new moon celebration based on what scripture says. Not a single person anywhere in the world based on Google. Not one. Now I'm sure there may have been some, but we just couldn't find them. Not one. But we did it anyway. We said, this is what the scripture says, and we're going to obey it anyway. Yep. And then we started not only living it, we started sharing it and teaching it. And people started coming. Some of you started coming. And you started coming and obeying it and honoring it by, by faith. You saw it in scripture, you honored it by faith. And then we started teaching this message, and people around the world started coming. Some came, some left, but they started seeing it. And now people are starting to see it all around the world. But here's some of the other things that God did through you. When I say you, I'm talking to the people that started honoring us. Us as a family. The bride of Christ. He showed us the month of Aviv. Which is his annual feast day in scripture. And you can read about that in Exodus 12 and Exodus 13. 1. He taught us the, the new moon celebration and what that actually means. It's a day that no man knows. And it's a it's the beginning of every month, and we can read that in many scriptures. Isaiah sixty six verse twenty three. You can read about it. That that day is the day that we start our months when we start to count to the seventh day. He taught us the true seventh day rest based on the new moon. Of we see spot the new moon and we count to seven. If you go outside tonight, it's the fourteenth day of the month. It's a full moon, and God showed us His calendar just like He showed the Israelites His calendar through Moses. He showed us the true Passover day on the correct day, on the 14th day of the first month. Starting at twilight, right before the dark, he showed us that. And we honored it. And we've been honoring it ever since we learned it. He showed us his unleavened bread which is on the correct day, which is the day after. You know, some people do it based on a different calendar. But we were on God's calendar. And God showed it to us. And we've been honoring it on that calendar. He showed us the feast of first fruit. And what that meant. And how Jesus was the first fruit to rise to, the, to heaven. And the next fruit that's going to come are the first fruits, which is the people, the bride of Christ, are going to go meet the Lord in the air someday. And we believe it's probably going to happen on the Feast of Tabernacles. But we don't know exactly. We believe it is based on some of the things that he showed us. We don't know exactly what day. Because the Feast of Tabernacles is seven days. It happens to be a day that no man knows also. It's interesting how God works. But he also showed us the Feast of Weeks. And we honored the Feast of Weeks based on God's calendar. See, it didn't make sense at first because we couldn't go by the Gregorian calendar because you've got to count 50 weeks or seven full weeks in one day. 
That made no sense until we started honoring the new moon. And then it makes complete sense. See, God revealed that to us. We didn't go search it out. He revealed it to us because we were obeying him over time. This year, he fulfilled the Feast of Trumpets. Well, we believe that on September 11, 2018, the Lord fulfilled his Feast of Trumpets. Here's how. Because he had all of us in a panic. Didn't we? We were all in a panic. We were thinking the Lord was coming that Feast of Trumpets. Because for eight years, he had a focus, zeroed in, laser-like focus on the Feast of Trumpets. Didn't let us... We lived Feast of Trumpets from Feast of Trumpets. We saw everything for the Feast of Trumpets. We did it three, four, five years in a row. We got rid of our silver, our gold, all kinds of stuff because we believed the Lord was coming on the Feast of Trumpets. Because in his time, because remember, there's a time for everything, his timing was that that's what he needed us to focus on, which was the Feast of Trumpets. Because who else was focusing on the Feast of Trumpets based on the new moon? No one. But he had us focus on it. So he zeroed in on that day and he told us to look at that day and he gave us scripture and gave us all the signs and we prophesied about it and we told the world that that's the day he could come and so he was, said he could and we all believed it by faith that we all were there honoring him with passion, with our money we gave and guess what God did? He showed us that the Feast of Trumpets meant it was time to blow the trumpet. In other words, to warn the people that he's coming and to gather his elect and that's exactly what happened this year. We preached this word to over 5,000 people in a month and a half in India and Africa. The brothers in India and the brothers in Africa went to work. And they're still going to work. One of them just told me yesterday he has 15 pastors that he's been teaching the Sabbath day and the new moon celebration and they're all starting to honor it. Amen. Even if we're not there doing it, they're still doing the work. We haven't given up hardly any money because God we haven't given, hasn't given us any more yet. But you know what? No matter. They don't live by bread alone like we do. I mean, they, they live by the word of God. I mean, they live by the word of God. They, they live, can live off manna alone. That's all they can live on. And they're okay with it. And they're joyful every day. We have a weekly service every day. We're talking. These guys are joyful. They're telling us all the stuff they're doing. It is convicting. That's the word I can use of what they're doing versus what we have. I have no room to complain about anything. And neither do all of us. No room. These brothers are out there in the middle of nothing with nothing with sh sh no shoes on, walking around sharing the message. Because they love the Lord. But the Lord fulfilled his Feast of Trumpets Day, and we believe it happened on September 11th, which is the exact day, based on the scripture we've shown, it happened 4,000 years ago, on September 11th. Then we fulfilled the Day of Atonement, 10 days later which was September 19th and September 20th of 2018. Because we learned that the Day of Atonement could have been the day of, that no man knows also because it's a two-day feast as well. We were ready to go, waiting for him to come, thinking of the good. Because again, he had us focused in on that one. And guess what? The Lord didn't show up that day, but he did do something. He had us pray. He had thousands, of, probably hundreds if not thousands of people praying for the Lord to come because he had us focus on it. He had people in India and Africa and all of us in America stay up 24 hours. A lot of us stayed up 24 hours. The guys in India and Africa stayed longer than that because they were there in the street and they stayed with ours. They fasted, they would eat, they prayed for an entire day. Their whole ministry was doing this. Never before that's happened in 4,000 years on the correct day based on the new moon. It hasn't happened since Moses' days. But it happened this year and the Lord used you to pull it off. And so the Lord fulfilled his feast day, Day of Atonement, we believe, on September 19th and September the 20th. And then from there, he said, okay, now you can rest. <laughs> and he gave us the day of uh, Feast of Tabernacles. And that was a seven-day rest, and we did. We rested, Right? We weren't, we didn't go and spend a bunch of money to go to a hotel. We didn't do a bunch of extracurricular stuff. We relaxed. Because we needed it. But you know what? The Lord said, you're getting faithful servants. You did the right thing. You did the work. And God sent me a message from some guy, uh, on a text message. And it said, in the month of September, you will be remembered. You will be remembered, you and your family. Just as Noah was remembered when he built the ark, 
You'll be remembered in the month of September. I still have the text on my phone. I wrote it on the board of my wall. And it was from a guy, we looked him up on Facebook to see where he came from, and it said he was a, a, a preacher from, or he worked in the kingdom of God. That's what it said. That's all it said. There was no address for him or nothing. And we're like, amen. <laughs> that was a message. And it was so encouraging because my daughter, you know, we were thinking that he was telling us that he was going to come on the Feast of Trumpets. That's what he was trying to tell us. No, he just said, you'll be remembered this year. My God, my daughter reminded me of that. She said, you know, maybe he was just saying that you'll be remembered. He didn't say he was coming. And I was like, you know, you're absolutely right. He just said you'll be remembered. And I said, amen. And so we had to move on. But I want you guys to understand what the Lord wants you to know right now. You that have been honoring the feast days, honoring the commandments, honoring the Sabbath days, by faith, coming to this message, sharing your faith. I love hearing the good news stories that you guys have been doing. I love hearing it. Because I have one I'm going to share for myself as well. That the Lord has now is remarrying his bride right now. He divorced them before. He's remarrying them right now through you. You are the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. We are the church of Philadelphia. And our job now is to share that message with the world. He's given us more time because the full number of the Gentiles have not come in yet. The full number of the Israelites that want to know the truth have not come in yet. And so that's our job now is to do what Philip's doing out there. Mm -hmm. Out there sharing his faith. Out there excited, motivated, and Lila. Out there in Florida doing their thing. What Sarai's doing. You know, out there sharing her faith. What the brothers in Indian Africa are doing out there sharing their faith. That's our job now. Is to do that. Is to do that with intent to make a disciple, baptize them, and teach them to obey the commandments. Like Matthew 28 says to do. So I just want to share, you know, for me it's just been really encouraging because, you know, my wife mentioned that we've been going to this, uh, my friend's house around the corner. I've been praying, God, what do I do? How, how do I, what, what, what do I do? How, what do I do next? Because I really wasn't super fired up about what I was doing for a living and, and uh, you know, doing my marketing and stuff. I was doing it, was making money and doing well or whatever, but I wasn't enjoying it. And the Bible says a man should enjoy what he does. So I said, God, what do I do? And a couple of days later, a lady asked me to speak in Thailand. So pray for me, by the way. Uh, and, uh, I was going to Thailand because I got to get my ticket. I'd never been out of the country, really, other than Mexico. And God said, you know, you need to go to Thailand to speak. And so they're paying for my airline ticket to go and my hotel to go to Thailand for three days to speak. And I'm going to Thailand to speak. And it's going to be encouraging. And people are going to hear the word of God preached uh, in a way that they can hear it. And then from there, my buddy, I was around the corner. I said, God, what do I do? And he brought this. He said, God said, go see Kairos. And Kairos has been a God sent to me personally. And I just want to share this because over the years, it's been tough going through this eight years. But I've had a friend that uplifted me and motivated me, inspired me, and would listen to me. And every day, Kairos has this thing called a beamer. It's a medical device that's patented. And what it does, it sends a beamer signal through your body. And it helps your body do what your body does naturally. In other words, helps your body heal itself by opening up the, the arteries and capillaries so the blood and oxygen can flow through the body and any nutrients you put in will flow through and your body can heal itself because we know that the Bible says that our life is in the blood. And so because of that, we started going. He said, come over to our house. Come over to my house. You can use it anytime you want and get yourself healthy. So I started going over there. And it was miraculous because, you know, I was feeling good and whatever. And then me and Jamie were at my daughter's soccer game the other day. And I had a brochure for the Beamer. And I started reading the brochure. And as I'm sitting there reading it, I said to myself, I'm reading the brochure. <laughs> because if you, you guys know in this ministry, my eyes have been going bad. And I couldn't see the street signs as I'm driving down the street. And it was really scary and, you know, unnerving that I was, you know, my, my eyes were going really bad. But I'm sitting there reading this brochure, and I said, Jamie, come here for a second. I gave it to her, and I said, let me show you that. See that fine print, which was like one point or two point? It was the smallest print you could probably get. I said, I can read that. She goes, no, you can't. And I read the whole thing. And she said, wow. She was blown away. This beamer had helped heal my sight. Now, why is that important? 
Because the Bible says in the last days we're going to have the power to heal the sick, to raise the dead, the blind will see. And now God's given me a tool that I can get behind because I know that the power is the blood. Because our life is the blood. But why is that important to us? I'm just sharing that with you because I'm, I'm excited finally again because I've been able to merge my business and the ministry together. I can now work six days and be excited about working six days. And, and God wants me to inspire you to look at your business from that perspective. Look at what you do from that perspective. Look at your job. If you homeschool, then look at your homeschool. How can I have this mindset? How can I homeschool and bring people to the Lord? How can I do that? That's the question I ask. How can I make my business represent the Lord? You understand? Well, it's not separate. Because for years it was hard. It was a hard balance. Business from doing the Lord's ministry. Because I would go out and do business. And then I would think, oh, man, I should be out sharing my faith. And it was always a conflict. But now it's not a conflict. Because they're all one. Every time I'm, I go over to listen to the Beamer, I'm sharing my faith with, with Kairos. So yesterday we were talking about the Sabbath day. And we were going out looking at the moon. And he's understanding the feast days. He's understanding. We went through the whole process. He wanted to honor it today, but he had already had some stuff, people flying in and out of town. He said, but I said, but your heart needs to be there. That your heart wants to be here. And God has grace because he knows you're just learning. So next week you can plan for it. And he's open. But see, the Bible, God gave that to me. Because now my business and my ministry are the same. One and the same. And God wants you to look at your life and say, well, how can my life be the same? What can I do to where my life and everything is all mingled together. How can I do it all as one? That's what the Lord wants you to do. He wants you to make your life intertwined with whatever you're doing. No matter if you're a child, no matter if you're a dog. I love my daughter because when she did with us at her soccer team, they, they now pray. At the beginning of every game, she had re recommended them to pray and they all now pray together. At the beginning of every game. I mean, you don't understand, there's an entire soccer field out there, and our team kneels down on the ground along with the coach and prays to the Lord. Now, there may be some people in that group that may not believe in Jesus, but that doesn't matter. They're still on the team and they pray to the Lord. She's planting seeds. That's awesome. I love my son. Every time my son is talking about something or having a challenge or situation, he's always talking about the Lord. Always talking about God in some way, giving an example, even challenges us. You know, is that from the Lord? Or, you know, he challenges us in our, in our walk. I love that. You know, so that's what you, he wants you to do. He wants you to look at your life and how can you make impact in this world right now? Because that's what he's waiting for. He's waiting for enough of the Gentiles to come in and enough of the Israelites that want to learn the truth to come back so he can remarry them again also so we can all make it to the kingdom of heaven again. That's his goal. That's what he's waiting for. And we have to do it. Just like Moses had to be the one that would lead the Israelites out. If he had have said no, then the Israelites would have never left and we wouldn't be sitting here today. So if we don't teach this message, who will? If we don't have that heart after what God has done through us, who will? Are we going to be like the Israelites and not do what he would, you know, lead this message and not die to ourselves and, and pour ourselves and give ourselves away to the people? When he's done all this for us, through us, again, 4,000 years later to the exact day, are we going to just, oh, well, you know, I'm busy, I got stuff to do. I don't think that's a, that's a wise idea. Because we saw what happened the first time, and we don't want that to happen this time. So let's, let's do it with the right heart. Let's do it because we want to do it, not because we have to do it. Let's read this last scripture. Colossians. Colossians 3. Start at verse 1. The title is Living as Those Made Alive in Christ. In other words, this is how we should be living if you believe you've been made alive in Christ. It says, Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So what should our hearts be set on? Christ. Christ. No, it should be set on heaven. Uh-huh. And Christ.
Christ. Both. We should be set on heaven and Christ. In other words, making it to the kingdom of heaven and being there with Christ. See, because a lot of people say, well, I'm thinking about Christ. Yeah, but are they thinking about the kingdom of heaven? Are they thinking about making it there? Are they thinking about bringing people to it? He said, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So the only thing we can bind on earth and take to heaven are souls, people. So this is what our hearts and our mind need to be focused on. Look what it says in verse 2. It says, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you die, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When did we die? We, we died when we were baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. So see, if you were baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, then you have the gift of the Holy Spirit inside of you. See, this is the key that we got to realize, is that we need to set our hearts on things above and our minds on things above. Everything we do in our life should be centered around Christ, not centered around our business, and then Christ is the Sabbath day we go to every once in a while. You understand? Not school is the most important thing, and then our lives, you know, Christ gets you know, a little bit in there every once in a while. No, we should be doing it with the intent to make a disciple. You go to school, you should go with the intent to make it a disciple. You go to work, you should do it for an intent to find someone to speak to God about. I love what Philip was saying. Everywhere he goes, somehow, the conversation ends up about Jesus. <coughs> somehow. I know what that feels like because everywhere I go, I'm almost always ends up talk, somehow talking about Jesus. Almost every single time. Because it's my heart. My heart's always thinking about the Lord, always thinking about the kingdom of God, and at every moment when I meet someone, I'm trying to find the way to get in, the angle, trying to figure it out. But do you have that heart? Because this is the heart of people that have the Holy Spirit. This is the life you should be having. Ask yourself this question. When was the last time you made a disciple? When was the last time you even attempted to? Let's just put it that way. Because everyone hasn't made a disciple. Everyone has a different gift. But when was the last time you went out and set out with the intent to make a disciple? In other words, by maybe inviting someone over your home. Maybe cooking them a dinner to serve them. Maybe talking to them about something and maybe go paint their house. or You know, just serve someone for no apparent reason. When was the last time you've done that with that heart to make a disciple? Try to Get someone in your life with the intent. You should ask that question to yourself because that's a question God wants you to know that that's what it takes. We have to do it with intent. Because look what it says. Verse 3, it says, For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ Jesus. For Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. See, if we live like this, when Christ appears, we'll be with him in glory. This is how we're supposed to be living. Isn't that how the disciples lived when Jesus walked? Every waking moment of their day, they were preaching the Lord. When they were put in jail for preaching the Lord, guess what? They preached the Lord. And guess what? The door chains were open. They came out. Guess what they did? They rejoiced to preach the Lord. When Stephen was stoned, what did he do? He said, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. He forgave the people. He was preaching the Lord as he was getting stoned. You get it? That's the heart of a disciple. That's the heart we're supposed to have. And God is commanding you and trying to compel you to do it. Let's keep reading. Verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of these things. Anger. Rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self and its practices and have put on your new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. So this is very important to do. This is something I've learned to do, because something I don't understand the meaning of words. I recommend, and this is an exercise for all of you, especially you that are young, I'd recommend you to look up each one of these words and look at the definition of them and then study them out so you can know what they mean. Because you may not know what malice means. So look up the word malice. Look up each one of those words in the dictionary so you can get a clear understanding of what they mean so you can learn to repent from them. 
Look them up. Let's keep reading. Verse 9. Do, do not lie to each other. Since you have taken off your old self with its practices and put on your new self, which is being renewed of the knowledge of the image of the Creator. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, cynic, slave or free. But in Christ, but Christ is all and is in all. See, with us, there is no difference. With the bride of Christ, there is no difference between a Jew and an and a, and a Israelite or a, 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 an Israelite and a Gentile or, or someone, a man or a female. There's another scripture that says that. It's Galatians 3, verse 25. There's no difference. See, we're all the same. There's no difference as child or adult. We're all different. They're all the same. You understand? So if we're all the same, we need to all be acting the same. Now, we all have different gifts, and you should use those gifts according to what God has given you. But with the intent to make a disciple, baptize them, and teach them to obey the commandments. That needs to be the intent of your life. If your life consists of work, 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 and then I go rest on the Saturday so I can get back to work, that's the wrong attitude. The attitude should be while I'm at work, I should be figuring out ways to share my faith, to let my light shine, to invite someone over my house, to study the Bible with someone. At, while you're at work. And then when you get off work, you may go study the Bible with someone at a restaurant that night. When you're at soccer or when you're at sports or basketball or baseball or sports or whatever you do, video game, you should be thinking, how can I impact someone in that video game to talk about the Lord? How can I maybe pray to someone and say, wow, thank God I won that game. And then they might say, wow, what do you mean thank God? Do you worship? You can have a, have a spiritual conversation. How many spiritual conversations do you have throughout the day? See, that's the attitude that we need to have as a disciple. It needs to be on our thoughts and on our hearts all day Every day. We need to let our light shine. When we leave this house, game time. Light shine. You know, kind of like when you walk into a room, what do you do first? Whoop, flip all the lights. So the light shine. Because if not, you need to be able to see where you're going, right? But another reason why you let the light shine is so others can see where they're going in the house. See, if you have, if you're, you know, I'm a parent, and so I'm sure some of you are parents. If you walk into your house at the middle of the night, it's dark, you're coming from a trip, and you're going to walk into the house, do you just let your kids and family go into a dark house? No, what do you do? You flip on the lights. Why? So they can see where they're going. And God's right now trying to flip on the lights too. And God calls us the light of the world. So that everyone else can see which direction to go. Because if you don't show that message to them, who's going to? If people at your job don't see your light shining, who's shining the light on them? Because I'm not. I'm not there. My wife's not. She's not there. Who's shining the light on the people around you? See, that's yeah, your job. God appointed you as the light. You understand? That's why he gave you this knowledge of the Sabbath day. The knowledge of all the things we went through. He gave it to you so you can be that light that shines in your farm, in your area. That's what you're supposed to do. Let's keep reading. Verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen People. Isn't that a, just that sentence alone. This excites me. We're his chosen people. You were chosen out of 7.4 billion people in the world. God single-handedly plucked you out of whatever you were in and sat you down in front of this message and showed you the Sabbath day based on his new moon. And showed you all these feast days. Do you understand how rare that is? Do you realize how rare that is? Most people, I don't think you get it yet. That should excite you more than me. You should say, thank you, God, and get out today and go share your message. Because of that. See how rare that is? I mean, there's a, the reason why diamonds are so valuable is because they're hard to get. If you want a diamond, you got to go to the diamond field and cut through a lot of dirt. you got to dig through a lot of dirt. But when you get the diamond, what does it look like? Shame. No, it looks like a big old ugly rock. Looks like a big old ugly rock. Guess what you got to do with that rock? You got to dig it and chill so it chiseled off all the dirt and all the stuff around it, right? But then when it's all upside, lopsided and wobber jawed, like my wife calls it, it's all messed up looking, right? It don't look like a nice shiny diamond ring, do it? You know what they have to do then? They got to polish it off and they got to shine it and they got to chill it and they got to shine it and they got to grill it. They got to polish that thing up until it's a brilliant shine. And then guess what? You do. You'll pay a million dollars for one if it's big enough, right? See, because it was hard to get. It wasn't easy. It had to go through some stuff. A diamond has to go through some banging, through some 
chiseling through some hard times before it becomes a brilliant diamond. And guess what? Your life, God had to go through stuff with you too. You know your life. You know what you had to go through. You know the pain and suffering you had to go through. You know the things that you went through as a child and maybe your family or friends or someone did to you. You know all the hardship that God did. He had to do that for one reason. One reason only, like I said earlier, so you will fear the Lord. He did it to chisel you up, to get you nice and polished, so you're at this moment, at this time, today, on October 24th, so you can hear this message, knowing that he has chosen you out of all these 7.5 billion people to come to go preach this message to the Lord. And that's why he chose you. And he had to put you through all of that to get you right here. So you can say, man, hey man, you know what? You're right. Let me put, let me take, take, change my whole life around. Let me put you in the center and everything I think about is with you and everything goes around me from this point on. Every day. Not just on one day. So this is what God says. He says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you have grievances against someone. For as the Lord forgave you, I'm sorry, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. So this is what we have to do. we got to clothe ourselves in compassion. We should be compassionate to the people we meet. We should have that compassion in our heart and say, man, these people are struggling, they're hurting. What can I do to serve them? What can I do to love them? Our neighbors. I want to start doing fun stuff in our neighborhood. We talked about having, you know, even a child's uh, talent show to bring kids in the neighborhood so their parents will come. You know, you should start thinking about what can you do in your area? What can you do in your house? If you have a house, invite people over. Start fellowshipping. We need to have compassion for the people. We need to be kind. And have humility and gentleness and patience with these people that are learning. Like, k Rock, me and him were going through it. I was up till 12.30 at night with him. You know, just sitting out there, going through the moon, standing outside looking at the moon. He's trying to figure this thing out. But i got to be patient. So we have to be patient with these people and bear with one another as well. Look what it says, verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as a member of one body, you were called to peace. The Bible says we need to let Christ rule in our heart. In other words, Christ is the ruler of our heart. Not he's just part of us, or we talk to him when we go and have a quiet time. Or No, he's the ruler of our heart. Every thought and inclination you have should be thinking, wow, how, how would the Lord do this? Would the Lord want me to do this? Would this be beneficial to the Lord? Would this bring someone closer to the Lord? Imagine if every day you thought that type of mindset. How much more peaceful would you be? How much more joyful would you be? See, this is, I mean, I'm talking for myself too. I have to get even better at this. And that's why this message is convicting for me. Every one of these messages are always convicting for me. Because I need to grow in this area too. But in the same way, we all need to grow together in this area. Because look what it says. I'm going to read it once more. Verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, and to sing God to God with gratitude in your hearts. Here's the key. Here's the kicker right here. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. That's the key. Whatever you do, do it in the name of the Lord. Let's end it off with prayer. Father God, I just want to thank you so much for this day, Father. Thank you so much for this message, God. Thank you so much for encouraging us to let us know how you've plucked us out single-handedly and taught us the scriptures, taught us all of your holy names, God. You've taught us how to live. 
He baptized us and got us our sins and washed them away. He's taught us how to repent. God, you've taught us how to look up every day and look at the moon and know when your calendar is, no matter where we are. Father, we're just so grateful for that. Thank you so much for separating us out and protecting us from all the hurricanes and earthquakes and floods and all the junk that's going on in this world, God, you've protected us. God, and I thank you so much for bringing us brothers and sisters that love you, that adore you, that are willing to die for you, that are willing to do whatever it takes. Father, I just want to thank you so much for that, God. And I just want to pray that we can all die to ourselves. We can all look at everything that we do with your eyes and, and say, God, this is for you. Let me make another disciple for you. Let me find someone that's open to hearing the truth for you. Father, I just want to pray that you give all of us that spirit and that heart today, that we can go out Teach this message in everything that we do. We do it for you. We love you. We thank you so much for all you do for us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.